is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of our workshop. That's Richard Stanley from the University of Miami and MIT. He's going to be talking about Stern's Triangle and upper homogeneous process. Well, I'm very glad that the uh, organizers of the original Mittag Leffler workshop were able to move it into this uh, online format. And uh, it's a big honor for me to be the first speaker. I just hope I don't uh, chase everyone away. So I'm going to talk about a uh, triangular array uh, called Stern's Triangle, and then a connection with a certain class of posets, which I call upper homogeneous. So Stern's Triangle is a defined similarly to Pascal's Triangle, but in addition to the rules defining Pascal's triangle, where the first row is a one and every row begins and ends with a one, uh, we add two consecutive entries just as in Pascal's triangle, but we also copy each entry down into the next row. So it's gonna look like this. Here is the initialization, a one at the uh, top and every row beginning and ending with a one. At the beginning, we just bring down this one now we add two consecutive entries in uh, this row to get these red twos. Then we bring down the three ones in the previous row to get this and then continue. So we add just like Pascal's triangle and bring down. So uh, this is uh, Stern's triangle. It's not really a triangle because uh, the number of entries in each row is uh, exponential rather than linear like Pascal's triangle. Well, there's some elementary properties that are easy to uh, understand. For instance, the sum of the entries in row n is uh, three to the n uh, because uh, every entry in row n minus one was used three times to uh, create a uh, row uh, n. Uh, one can show by induction that the largest entry in row n is the n plus first Fibonacci number. And a uh, more important property is that uh, if we let this angle n choose k be the kth entry in row n, and I'll begin with k equals zero, just like in Pascal's triangle. So these are the Stern analogs of binomial coefficients. Um, and we'll write Pn of x as a generating function for the, these numbers in the nth row. If it was Pascal's triangle, it would be one plus x to the n. Well, uh, here there's an, also a nice product formula for Pn of x because of the simple recurrence. Pn plus one of x is one plus x plus x squared, Pn of x squared. Because you can see that the term x, p n of x squared, corresponds to bringing down the previous row and the one plus x squared times p n of x squared to summing two consecutive entries. So solving this recurrence with the initial condition p zero equals one gives us this simple product formula for p n of x. It's the analog of the binomial theorem. So uh, a nice property of Stern's triangle that uh, has no counterpart for Pascal's triangle is that, uh, well, the nth row uh, stabilizes, meaning that uh, for any k, the kth entry in the nth row becomes a constant for n sufficiently large. And if we look at the generating function for these stable values, it's obviously just what we get from pn of x by letting n go to infinity. So it'll be this infinite product, one plus x to the two to the i plus x times, x to the two times two to the i. And I'll call the coefficient of x to the n bn plus one. That's the usual uh, notation for this famous sequence. b1, b2, b3, et cetera, is known as Stern's diatomic sequence. Sometimes it's prefixed with a zero. Uh, this sequence uh, 
that's a lot of remarkable properties. Um, and I could say it could be defined sort of directly, well, it's equivalent to this generating function, but we can just define it just directly by this recurrence. B1 of B1 is one, B2n is Bn, B2n plus one is Bn plus Bn plus one. I should mention historically that this mathematician, uh, Moritz Abraham Stern, uh, defined an array similar to Stern's triangle, but it began with two ones. It's called Stern's diatomic array. It's easy to transfer properties of one array to the other. I think the tr Stern's triangle uh, is simpler. It's more elegant and easily stated properties, but they're equivalent. Uh, the most amazing property of Stern's uh, triangle or Stern's diatomic sequence is that um, if we look at this, this sequence B0, B1, et cetera, every positive rational number occurs exactly once among the ratios Bi over Bi plus one. And these ratios are in lowest terms. So Bi and Bi plus one are relatively prime. We get some kind of canonical enumeration of the, uh, well, really I should say non-negative rationals if B0 is zero. A canonical enumeration of the non-negative rationals. So uh, Sarah, I, I don't see the page numbers here, so I don't know where to stop. Uh, well, we can, uh, we can look at a analog of Pascal's triangle, the fact that the sum of the squares of the entries in the nth row of Pascal's triangle. Sorry, you didn't hear me today. I, I, you have yeah. gone, I think you've got everything covered. Oh, but yeah. I knew I should go up to page 12, but there's no page numbers in this full screen view. Right, but it was page 12 with pauses. So it was really only page three, I think. Oh no, page 12 with pauses. Like, you know, each time you put in a pause, it counted as another page number. Yeah, but. Right. Was, okay. But anyway, I think the after the sum properties, you were back on track again the slide labeled some properties. So I think you've got plenty here and I can, now what I'm gonna do is cut and paste the two together. Okay, good. Well, if you can do that, then yeah, it's no problem. Yeah, but this is plenty and I don't know which one you like better. Maybe I'll listen to the two of them and pick where, to, where exactly to cut it. But this is great. I really appreciate you're doing this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for giving it a second run. Yeah, well, it's no problem. It's very short too. <laughs> meeting, meeting's going well. Uh, a property of this array, which is very unlike Pascal's triangle, is that as n goes to infinity, the nth row has a limiting generating function. That is, the kth entry in the nth row becomes constant as n goes to infinity. And of course, that's just going to be this stable uh, realization is going to be what happens when you let n go to infinity in this uh, product. And so we'll get this uh, infinite product. And this, uh, the coefficients, uh, well, they're traditionally denoted Bn plus one, your very famous uh, numbers. It's the so-called uh, Stern's diatomic sequence, sometimes uh, with a zero in front. Uh, you can define, well, well it's, it's equivalent to this uh, generating function, but you can define directly Stern's diatomic sequence by the initial condition B1 equals 1, B2n equals Bn, and B2n plus 1 is Bn plus Bn plus 1. Well, I've highlighted this because I'll be looking at a refinement near the end of my talk. So this is uh, Stern's diatomic array, very uh, similar, but uh, they begin with two ones at the top. And you can transfer any property of one of these arrays to the other, but 
the Stern triangle is a little bit nicer. Uh, the most amazing property of Stern's diatomic sequence, which I don't really need, uh, but I'll state it, is that every positive rational number occurs exactly once among the ratios bi over i plus one. And they appear in lowest terms. Pretty surprising. <laughs> Why doesn't this continue? Okay, so uh, let's start. Let's look at some properties of Stern's triangle. In analogy to Pascal's triangle, we could ask, what are the sum of the squares of the entries in each row? And for Pascal's triangle, it's two n choose n. Well, I'll call this u two n, or more generally, u r n would be the sum of the rth powers. We get this sequence 1, 3, 13, 59, etc. You can look it up in the OEIS or figure it out otherwise that it satisfies this uh, recurrence relation you know, with constant coefficient, the linear recurrence with constant coefficients. So, uh, I mean, assuming that this conjecture is correct, it will have a uh, rational uh, generating function which looks like this. What about the sum of the cubes for a Pascal's triangle? You know, there is no nice uh, formula for the sum of the cubes, but here it's even simpler than the sum of the squares. It looks like it's three times seven to the n minus one. Or uh, another way of stating this uh, without mentioning Stern's triangle at all, just you know, look at the generating function. If you look at this polynomial, the sum of the cubes of its coefficients is three times seven to the n minus one. Well, let me sketch how you would prove this for u2 of n. Well, u2 of n plus one, we apply the recurrence uh, for the entries in the n plus first row. We could bring down uh, the kth entry in row n. So that'll contribute the square of that. We can add these two consecutive entries in row n, that gets squared, or we can and continue. I mean, each entry is brought down and squared, or the sum of two consecutive entries is squared. Altogether, we're gonna have three copies of n choose k squared. Here, here when we square this, and then here for the k minus one, you know, the previous term. And we're going to have two copies when we square this of this sum, n choose k, n choose k plus one, the product of two consecutive entries. So we need to look at this new sum. I'll call it u11 because uh, n choose k gets raised to the first power and n k plus one to the first power. Um, so this formula is saying u2 n plus one is three u2 of n plus two u11 one one of n. We play the same game for u11. One one. We get the sum of two consecutive entries times the next entry from O n or the other way around. And if you look, look at this, you'll see we're gonna get n choose k squared twice and n choose k times n choose k plus one twice. So we get this recurrence when you put it together with that, we, it becomes a matrix recurrence. Uh, very standard kind of uh, linear recurrence with uh, constant coefficients and several variables over here and several unknowns here, two unknowns. If a times the nth is the n plus first and a to the n times the first is the nth. So, uh, the seek everything governed by the characteristic or polynomial of A, which is X squared minus five X plus two. Since a matrix satisfies its characteristic polynomial equation, we'll get uh, uh, U2 of N plus one is five U2 of N minus two, U2 of N minus one. That's a very standard method for solving linear recurrences. Um, and U11, 
you know, it's part of the same system, so that also satisfies the same recurrence. For sums of cubes, we go through the same procedure and now we'll get this matrix. They happen to have an eigenvalue equal to zero. That's why we've got a simpler answer for the sum of cubes. Uh, only the seven becomes relevant. Only the eigenvalue seven becomes relevant when n is greater than or equal to one. So it's some constant times seven to the n. When you do this in general for rth powers, u r of n, this method will give a matrix of size about r over two. But uh, I had conjectured that the true order is of order r over three. And uh, in fact, I have an exact formula for the order of smallest order of this recurrence. And David Speyer showed that this is a upper bound on the order of the recurrence, a very clever argument. And all of this can be greatly generalized uh, to much, much more general uh, recurrences. But I want to get on to, that gives you an idea of uh, one property of Schoen's triangle. I'll mention quickly another one because there's an interesting open question associated with it, the modular properties of Stern's triangle. Like you might recall for Pascal's triangle, the number of odd binomial coefficients in row n is two to the number of ones in the binary expansion of n, the number of Luca. For Stern's triangle, this is completely different kind of behavior for these modular properties. If I let G M A be of N be the number of elements in row N that are congruent to A mod M, and look at the generating function for that over all, you know, the rows N, then this is a rational function. This is essentially due to Resnick. And here's what some of them look like. This is for M equals two, the two residue classes mod two, three, four. I mentioned, I show these because you can see uh, some behavior that I don't have an explanation for. And th this goes on for more data, which I won't show here. Uh, you know, here's up to five, I do have. The uh, denominators factor a lot. Quite a few of the numerators have only one uh, term. As I say, this persists for larger values of n. And a lot of the numerator coefficients are powers of two. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them, including the leading coefficient for all my data is always a power of two. So what is going on? Yeah. I'll leave that as a question. And let's go on now to, uh, well, yeah, here are my three questions. Why are there so many denominator factors? Why do some numerators have a single term? Why are so many numerator coefficients a power of two? Okay, now I'm going to associate in a natural way a certain poset or partially ordered set with Stern's triangle. And I want to analyze its combinatorial properties by looking at the, its Ehrenbohr quasi-symmetric function. So let me review. Normally, it originally is defined for finite graded posets with zero and one of rank n. I assume you know what, the, what I mean by the flag H vector of P. Uh, it's defined for any subset S of one up to N minus one. And this F S N I will use to denote Gessel's fundamental quasi-symmetric function. The N indicates you know, that this is homogeneous of degree N. Because when we were just given S, it's not clear what subset, what set S is a subset of. And uh, Richard Ehrenborg defined a quasi-symmetric function EP. Well, this was not how he originally defined it, but uh, this is, well, this is a theorem for him, but a, a very simple theorem, but it's the quickest definition. It's just the generating function for the flag H vector, the coefficient of F S N is beta P of S. Well, in general, you cannot do a lot with this quasi-symmetric function, although 
It might be interesting. I mean, there's all kinds of bases known for quasi-symmetric functions. Maybe in some cases, it would be interesting to expand in terms of these bases. But the real the interesting situation is when this is a symmetric function. And I just mentioned this as a sort of sample result for finite posets. EP is a symmetric function if every interval of P is rank symmetric. You can get a lot of interesting uh, symmetric functions this way. For instance, if P is a non-crossing partition lattice of size n plus one or rank n, then every interval is in fact self-dual, which is stronger than rank symmetric. And the E of P is the parking function, symmetric function, the action or the Frobenius characteristic of the action of S n on parking functions of length n. And there's, there's other interesting examples of such posets. Well, let's extend EP to infinite posets. I'll assume my posets are graded by the non-negative integers. They have a unique minimum element zero, so that would be P zero. And um, well, in the future notation, row i will be the number of elements of rank i. Lambda of sub t for an element t of p is the principal order ideal generated by t, that is all the elements less than or equal to t. And it turns out the, when I say the correct way to define ep is just the sum of e lambda of t over all t and p. So these are finite, the lambda of t's are finite graded posets with zero and one. So we use the previous definition. This is an inhomogeneous quasi-symmetric power series. When T has rank N, this E lambda T is of degree N. Let's note uh, one nice property of uh, EP that it behaves well under product. EP cross Q is EP EQ. Okay, now there's a very, there's a nice class of posets, again, for which P is a, EP turns out to be a symmetric function. If we have one of these graded posets as above, I'll call it upper homogeneous or upo. Well, let's say it has more than one element to avoid some trivial exceptions later. If we look at the dual order ideal, principal order ideal generated by T all elements greater than or equal to T, it should be isomorphic to P. Every, all principal dual order ideals are isomorphic. A chain is a pole, the non, just a non-negative integer, zero, one, two, et cetera. A pole is preserved by direct products. And the less trivial, very interesting example, I don't have time to discuss it further, but if you fix a prime P, the subgroups of, you know, the free abelian group Z to the K, whose index is a power of P, ordered by reverse inclusion, is an upo poset. What can you say about E of P, Ehrenberg's quasi-symmetric function for upo posets? Well, we let fp of q be the rank generating function of p, so the coefficient of q to the n is the number of elements of rank n. It's immediate from the upo property that alpha of p evaluated at the set c1 less than c2 less than ck. This means the number of chains of p whose ranks have c1, c2 up to ck is just as product of rank, you know, rank sizes. How many, we can choose C1 and row of C1 ways. Then by the upo property, we can choose C2 and row of C2 minus C1 ways, et cetera. And that leads to a, immediately to a formula for E of P in terms of the monomial symmetric function. So E of P is a symmetric function and the monomial coefficients are these simple products. It's the rank size, the, corresponding to the parts of lambda. Another nice property, uh, which first 
observed by a high school student, I believe, uh, that uh, but immediately equivalent to this previous property, that EFP is just the, this product of rank generating functions evaluated at x1, x2, etc. Well, this formula implies, together with some of the theory of total positivity developed by Asen, Schoenberg, and Whitney, for instance, EFP is sure positive in this UPO case if and only if the rank generating function is a rational function, the numerator has only negative real zeros and the denominator has only positive real zeros. Okay, in this degree at least one. So now I can look at Stern's post set. It's just the post set <clears throat> that you get by uh, looking, you know, Stern's triangle and seeing which uh, entries, you know, the n plus first row depend on the previous entries. So we start here, and well, these are the initial conditions, and then we bring down this entry. Then we add these two, so we, so we get this and this. We bring down these like this, and then the initial conditions, this. And we just continue, so. Do a big zigzag between all the points, do a new point above all of them, and another one at the left and right. I should, I should mention it's not a lattice. These two elements, circled elements, do not have any upper bound. It's not hard to see that S is actually an upper poset. Its rank generating function is this rational function, which means by the theorem I stated before that it, Ehrenborg's quasi, well, in this case, symmetric function is sure positive. Actually, it's not hard to expand that explicitly in terms of sure functions. Hmm. Only sure functions with one or two rows appear in this sum. In fact, it's actually H positive. It's an even stronger property. Um, well, I could mention that, or I should mention that if we label each element here by the number of paths to the bottom, then we're going to get exactly Stern's triangle as the labels, because that's exactly the recurrence of Stern's triangle. I mean, that's why this poset was defined that way. So let's look more closely at some interval from, from uh, element to the bottom. The total number of chains in that interval will be the entry, that entry in Stern's triangle. So I've done it here. This 19 uh, means the uh, 19th entry in this row. A row would be one, two, three, in the fifth row. So what is the um, recurrence? It's the sum of the 10th and 9th entries. So the way it's set up, the even index entries are the ones that get brought down, have only one element below them. The odd index ones are the sum of the previous two. So uh, the 19 is 10 plus 9, the 5 gets brought to, down from the 10, but the 9 is 5 plus 4, etc. The 2 goes below the 4. Well, anyway, you go, you continue until we get down to this 1 at the bottom. And so we have this post set whose number of maximal chains is the entry 7 of Stern's triangle. Well, this post set is a distributive lattice. It's the lattice of order ideals of this post set. In general, we're going to get um, every entry, every every interval of this Stern's post set is a distributive lattice. The whole thing is not a lattice, but every interval is a distributive lattice, and that means these numbers 
number of maximal chains in the distributive lattice, that's the number of linear extensions of its host set of joint irreducibles. These numbers in uh, Stern's triangle are, you know, there are certain uh, terms of the Stern sequence. So we've expressed in some kind of canonical way the terms of Stern's diatomic sequence as the number of linear extensions of a post set. Well, is there anything to be gained uh, from this uh, insight? So in this example, well, what it's saying is the 18th entry in row seven, the reason this is an 18 here and this is a 19 is because remember my, my rows begin with the zeroth entry. N choose zero is the first entry. Well, this 19th means the 19th entry in the row counting in the usual way, because that way we'll get the 19th entries will be B19. As long as uh, the, we're not halfway across the row, as long as this 18 here or 19 is less than half the row length, which is two to the eighth minus one, you know, then this will be the uh, a number of the Stern diatomic sequence. The night, well, this will be the 19th term will be the, uh, the 19th entry in this triangle. So uh, we get that B19 equals seven. Well, uh, what, as I said, what can you gain from this uh, approach? Well, one thing, there's many natural refinements of the number of linear extensions of a post set. So that and, and gives these refinements of these numbers B and. And one can look and see if any of them uh, might be interesting. And I'll show you one, only one so far have I found that might be called interesting. Let me quickly review what I mean by the uh, P Eulerian polynomial of a finite post set. So P here is a finite post set. It's naturally labeled. So it's labeled, its elements are labeled one up to P little P where in the, they respect the ordering of P. L of P is a set of linear extensions of P. The P Eulerian polynomial A P of Q is the sum over all linear extensions Q to the number of descents of W. It's a basic result from the theory of P partitions that uh, this does not depend on which natural labeling you choose. And uh, one reason why uh, well, these polynomials are interesting is that uh, if you let omega p n be the number of order preserving maps from p into an n element chain, this is the order polynomial of p, then uh, the generating function for the values of the order polynomial is a rational function and its numerator is this Eulerian polynomial well, times q. If you let the post set be an anti-chain, we just got the usual Eulerian polynomials. Here we'll get n to the p, we'll get the standard generating function for n to the p due to Euler. Here's an example, a naturally labeled post set. It's five linear extensions, the number of descents. And so the Eulerian polynomial would be one plus three q plus q squared. Okay, so now I can give a refinement of the number BN in Stern's diatomic sequence. <clears throat> so say PN is a post set associated to the nth element uh, beginning with n equals one of row R. For R sufficiently large, then we have this uh, stabilization that the uh, number of linear extensions of PN will be BN. What happens to the post set as R increases is that we just add new elements at the bottom that is not going to change the number of linear extensions. So eventually we get this stabilization. And uh, 
Well, now look at this kind of uh, Q analog of the recurrence that define Bn. Remember, Bn satisfied this recurrence. B2n is Bn. B2n plus 1 is Bn plus Bn plus 1. And I'll define B1 of Q to be 1. B2n of Q is Bn of Q. That's the same as here. And now this recurrence breaks up into these two pieces, depending on whether n is conjugate to 1 or 3 mod uh, 4. If you let Q be 1, they you just get this recurrence back. Notice the Q always multiplies the even indexed term. And then one can show that this Q analog of Bn is the Eulerian polynomial corresponding to this poset Pn. One final thing uh, we could do is it's kind of natural to look at the sum of all of these uh, Q analogs of Bn for all the, en all the entries of rho n of Stern's triangle. So I'll call that ln of Q, the uh, rho sums, um, or the Q analogs of each entry. This is equivalent to saying twice the sum of Bk of Q up to 2n minus 1 plus B2n of Q. This is this twice because the Stern's triangle has a symmetry about the middle and there's one middle term, which is B2n of Q, which actually equals one. So when you put Q equals one, we'll get the sum of the entries in row N, three to the N. And I bring up this ln of Q uh, just only because I have two conjectures that maybe someone would be interested in looking at. It has only real zeros. I have no idea how that might be proved, but this one shouldn't be so difficult, I would think. L4n plus 1 of q is divisible by L2n of q. Okay, so now you have something to think about during the break, so uh, I can stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Richard. That's wonderful. If people would like to add something in the chat in lieu of applauding, go ahead now, or you can give your reaction. and. Richard, you might want to look over at the gallery mode so you can see their reactions. Where do I get gallery mode? Or? Top right, I think. If you unshare your screen. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. So I don't know if now you can see some smiling, mm -hmm. clapping faces there. I hope not oh, and then John Shereshian's actually I'm clapping. That's good too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can turn it over to questions. And Svante, do you want to take over the microphone to moderate the questions? Okay, so we have um, one uh, first question here from uh, Arvind Iyer. Uh, he's asked uh, if uh, every distributive lattice will appear as some interval of this. Uh, well, no, these distributive lattices are all planar. Uh, you know, you could see the whole post set, the whole post set S was planar. So you only get planar distributive lattices. And, uh, well, you get, how to say, you get the ones that um, don't have any element in the middle that's related to all the other elements of the uh, lattice. You get every planar distributive lattice, those, those and equivalently the post set of joint irreducibles has width at most two, you know, the largest antichains at most two. And you get all of those um, except when they're the sort of trivial case when you have one stacked on top of another one element in the middle that does uh, less than or equal to all the elements above and greater than or equal to all the elements below. So that's, those are the lattices you get. Okay, so we have um, a few, two more questions here. So one that's an uh, easy question uh, or, or to state is from um, Alejandro Morales, uh, is the generating function for the B and Q's nice? Oh, I could not see that, no. 
it's not some simple Q analog of the generating function for um, the, um, you know, BNs. Um, because they are, well, if you remember, we got this nice finite product with three terms in each factor. If you set Q equal to one, I mean, if you set all the X is equal to one, then the row sums would factor into a product of, uh, Uh, n small n polynomials with three terms each, and it doesn't do that. So the, the B and Qs do not, in general, factor very well. So I don't know a generating function, but that's a question to look at. Okay. So uh, I have, there's one more question from Dari Greenberg. Okay. He's asking if the um, the elements of the lattice are the elements of the pre partial commuting monoid uh, with uh, generators O, L, and R, where L and R commute. So I'm not sure which lattice you mean, Dari. Uh, well, whatever lattice he means, I don't think I would be able to answer immediately <laughs> the question. I would have to think. <laughs> I haven't thought along those lines at all. Okay. Uh, then there's one more uh, question from Vic Reiner. He asks if the uh, distribution, joint distribution with descents and uh, marge um, for those linear extensions of P, uh, do they have a nice recursive description? That's a good question too. I don't know of one. Or just marge by itself. I don't know. I, I looked a little bit. And nothing. There's nothing so simple as there was for DES. Okay, I think that was, uh, oh, there's some more uh, from John asking if there's some obvious manifold whose Poincaré polynomial is given by <laughs> the nth row of the crank. Well, I'm pretty sure nothing like that is known. That would be pretty amazing, actually. But um, um, I mean, it couldn't be a smooth orientable manifold because you don't have any kind of unimodality or something. You, you, even the even every other terms, the wild oscillations of terms. So it would be a very unusual manifold. <laughs> Okay, I think if I haven't missed something, I think that we've um, exhausted the uh, question and uh, about time to change to the next speaker, Sarah. Wonderful. Well, thanks thank again, you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. Nice.